When we're in Valor, we often stay at Karigiri. In 2010, we were met at Bangalore Airport by a hospital driver, Jibomani, Augustine, the Karigiri Hospital Administrator, and his wife, Balsa, the clinical psychologist. They had attended a wedding at Mangalore. The jeep reeked of chicken biryani and our cases had to be juggled between huge pans. Leftover wedding food was to survive a hot day in Bangalore and the six hour journey to Karigiri for the leprosy peace village that's annexed next to the hospital. We arrived at Karigiri as the dawn came and the bird calls and screeches of the monkeys greeted us. Valsa said, you're home now. We were indeed home. Taken to a familiar guest house and eating the food prepared by Daya. Always rice and dal, sometimes with chapatis, even for a 6am breakfast. The road to Karigiri is a long one. Once a rough track over hot, dust-laden, stony ground. Because it was for people with leprosy, the hospital was built in an isolated place 12 miles outside Valor, a district which once had a very high incidence of the disease. The road leads to the Shiflon Institute of Health Research and Leprosy Centre built in 1955, today a place of hope and possibility. Even the land around has become irrigated and many families of leprosy patients today are housed here. Karigiri means elephant hill, referring to the shape of the hill beneath which the hospital stands. Though not part of the uh, Christian Medical College Hospital, it has from the beginning been closely linked. The director of CMC is a member of the Karigiri board. It has a, long been a training centre for medical staff, especially in leprosy. Built in wilderness, the hospital grounds were devoid of all plant life, but over the years, trees and plants that will grow in hot, dry conditions have been diligently searched for. Now, the hospital is like an oasis, and this is despite severe water shortages at times. This well, dug 673 feet deep, had no water in it in 2005. From the top of Karigiri Hill, we see the hospital shrouded by trees. We've climbed there with Daniel, the ENT surgeon. A hospital security man carried a flask. On reaching the top, we were disappointed to find it contained anti-snake venom. We'd anticipated cups of coffee. Karigiri has had a distinguished history in leprosy treatment, research and training. This is one of the labs. The foot pad of mice is the only place leprosy bacteria can be cultured. Karigiri is the first place to make microcellular rubber footwear to protect the feet of people with leprosy. The disease causes them to lose sensation in the feet, which makes them more prone to injury. Cuffs are taken from the feet and special shoes made.
there is a school of nursing. I did some training of nurses in listening skills, whilst at the same time aiming to develop their English. These young women come from rural village backgrounds and speak only Tamil. In order to fund training, their extended families will have gone short, stinting themselves to raise the money. You can e imagine the huge pressure on the students to complete and do well, hoping that one day they will be able to provide income for their families. The girls are unlikely to have ever left home. They've probably slept in the same room as their parents, brothers and sisters and shared only family meals. Most are very shy. Once in training, they sleep in a large dormitory and eat together in a dining hall. Whilst family are able to visit for an afternoon once a month, the nurses will only go home once a year at Christmas for about 48 hours. Three years on, they will be expected to have completed nursing training and all their exams will be written in English. Perhaps this is the time to take you to the wards. These are divided into clean and unclean wards, depending on whether the patient's ulcers are clean and healing or deeply infected, in which case the stench is often quite bad. One characteristic of leprosy is the clawing of hands. See the splints which are put on the man's fingers? Untreated leprosy leads to loss of the fingers, loss of toes and feet, and the wastage and disfigurement of faces. Dr. Paul Brand, the famous leprosy surgeon, worked at Karigiri for many years, reconstructing hands damaged by the disease. This is the hospital's mission statement, committing it to providing holistic care. It takes into account all aspects of the patient's life and has developed a number of rehabilitation programmes together with a, a network of self-help groups. Rehabilitated patients work on the hospital campus, making clothing such as saris. The women are skilled at, at block printing and they use cloth woven at a nearby leprosy village to make tablecloths, bags, cushion covers. Pottery is also made for sale. A thambidori, a potter, who could neither hear nor speak, worked here for 17 years. Due to the dedication of many people, the incidence of leprosy has declined substantially and the hospital is now moving towards becoming a more general hospital. When we were there on Republic Day in 2010, the hospital offered free medical checkups for people living in nearby villages. 400 people came.
there are many patients with diabetes. Like those with leprosy, they can lose sensation in their feet and can therefore benefit from the hospital's expertise in the provision of special footwear. Many people do not wear shoes and they're at risk of burning their feet on hot ground or injuring them by treading on thorns and stones and glass. Because they have no sensation of the resulting injuries, the feet become infected, do not heal and gross ulcers develop. Amputations may then be needed. The next pictures are of the diabetes ward. A friend, the ward sister, is about to begin dressing foot ulcers. Now you may find some of the pictures distressing. Village women are being trained as community health workers in the newly opened Paul Brand Centre, the outpatient clinic in Katpadi, a suburb of Valor. I have loved sharing it in the life of Karigiri and all its many projects. Close friendship with Valser here in the Green Sari has enabled a rich tapestry of involvement and made for an interesting blend of counselling, teaching, chaplaincy and community work. Very sadly, four years after this, her husband Augustine died in Liberia, where he was serving as a missionary uh, in a hospital on sabbatical from Karigiri. Chaplaincy includes the Sunday evening services at St. Luke's Chapel on the campus. I sometimes share in these. The Reverend David Us is the resident chaplain. We visit a four-year-old girl early in the morning. She has a hereditary condition causing multiple tumours. Sadly, her brother died of the same disorder the previous year. There is a tumour on her face. The surgeon sought prayer before operating. And this was followed by prayer with the child and her mother. Here is the girl after successful surgery. Each morning people gather for prayers in one of the hospital quadrangles. David Doss leads in Tamil and the people on the wards eagerly tune in. Ward rounds begin immediately afterwards. This lady is in pain. An elderly patient, though, makes good progress. We celebrate births. The wo woman in the middle of this group has successfully undergone a hysterectomy. Together with her mother and other patients, we find ourselves in discussion about childbearing, hysterectomies, family stories, births. I have no Tamil and they 
have no English, but we have a sense of mutual understanding and togetherness as women. That evening, Devadas takes me to a village. All the people here have had leprosy and are Karagiri patients. The head of the village, the male in the picture, gathers a group of women together to discuss women's issues, dowry, marriage, female infanticide, and girls' education. From the fringes, some then listen to the conversation. They have an established weaving industry on which the village depends. One of Karagiri's projects that's been running for many years. The male leader, a committed Christian, spearheaded the work and was greatly influential. Sadly, he was killed in a road accident shortly after this. Another night, I'm asked to speak at the village house group. The people gather in the dark road. No sounds other than the insects and the noises of the night. They listen intently and share their thoughts. Many personal stories are told. The atmosphere is awesome. The night concludes with joyful Tamil singing and tiny cups of hot coffee. Back in Karagiri with my good friend Valsa, the clinical psychologist, working alone, she's welcomed my involvement. She's dealing with many difficult issues. Depression is common with leprosy and diabetes, but there are also problems of marital breakdown, the abuse of women, and tensions that come with living with poverty, alcohol abuse and poor education. This rickshaw driver from a very poor family is depressed. He defaulted from the clinic, ceased taking medication and a year later all his family including his one-year-old child, have the disease. A 25-year-old patient has clawed fingers. Physiotherapists are soaking his hands in water, softening them with coconut oil and using a coconut shell to open the stretched fingers. Rich sharing of our work takes place, combining mine in psychodynamic counselling with Valsa's specific insights into leprosy and her knowledge of Indian culture. We co-work situations and I introduce some family therapy. We thought this would meet with resistance, but to our surprise, Working with the whole family was welcomed and there were rewarding results. The men in this group are about to be discharged. Their self-esteem was low and they were depressed, fearing that they would not be able to find work because of the stigma of leprosy. Two aged under 40 had chosen not to marry because of the illness. They meet to discuss the possibility of forming a self-help group and explore finding a work project in which they can all share. Kerry Geary has a sister hospital at Guriatham, 25 miles away. As well as dealing with leprosy, this dilapidated hospital 
works with other stigmatizing diseases like HIV, AIDS, and disfiguring skin diseases. Both Karigiri and Goody Athens struggle financially, but the Danish government donated money for a small but essential annex to be built at Goody Athens. It was a great privilege to be invited to share along with the Danish representative and others the turning of the sod before building commenced. As I travel to a rural village with a, a nurse and social worker, we come across a group of women agricultural workers. Arriving at the village, we meet a man whose life has been turned around. He has a history of leprosy, resulting in the loss of fingers and toes. Rehabilitated, he worked on a farm, but in an accident, a bull's horn went through his side. Spent many months in hospital. When he was well enough to leave, he was helped by a small amount of money, the equivalent of about 10 or 15 pounds. He began a small shop selling basic groceries and rice, and with some vision, installed a phone for the use of village people. Because he bore the marks of leprosy, People were afraid to use the shop, but on seeing that the hospital staff treated him with respect, unafraid to touch him or shake his hand, the people came to terms with their fear and began using the shop. He was immersed in the life of the village and having discovered others with disabilities, had set up self-help projects for more than 40 people. He opened bank accounts for village people. Until then, being poor, they had been in debt or at least struggling, saving even a few rupees each week. They moved into credit. Everything is recorded scrupulously and trust and respect have grown. Today, he has not only the approval of his village, but status, and we find him at work in many different parts of Goody Atham Hospital and its outreach projects, enabling others to live with disability. His small home is next to the shop. We go through a town, congested and noisy with traffic. There are piles of rubble and dangerous looking buildings. Pavements do not exist. People weave their way precariously along the roadside. We pass an enchanting flower store with strong whiffs of jasmine permeating the hot still air. We go through even poorer areas as we head out to another rural village. I meet with an 18 year old woman born with a spinal defect. Until the last year, she's had to crawl on all fours, not even able to crouch in the fields to defecate. Since the mobile clinic discovered her, CMC Hospital has been able to straighten her spine, so she's now able to sit and walk. The hospital paid for a toilet to be built for her 
the first toilet in the village. Curious neighbours gathered as I was asked to pray a prayer of thanksgiving for the toilet. We celebrated with drinks of tender coconut. Another village hosts a very large self-help group. Whilst there, a mother beckoned me to follow her home, taking an erratic route through the village. On the ground at the back of a dilapidated house sat her daughter. Eight years ago, this depressed young woman had set fire to herself. Devoid of medical attention, she had become painfully thin. Gith Norman, the doctor with the mobile clinic, immediately arranged her admission into hospital. As I left the house, the mother returned to her work of making the insides of small matchboxes. Driving through the next village, we see the water has been turned on. It's hot and water is scarce. We return to Goodyatham Hospital, where a self-help group of young widows has gathered. They have received disappointing news that their contract for making paper bags has to be terminated. They were paid four rupees, four pence, for each bag. Given that they each have several children, and are the only wage earners, they're anxiously discussing how to earn sufficient money to maintain their families. You'll note that here in the foreground is our friend from the shop. Next, he takes us to the opening of a new disability facility. Dignitaries gather and a daya, a traditional lamp, is lit to begin the ceremony. The busy day ends with a beautiful Indian sunset, leaving me with much to reflect on. Disease, stigma, injustice, poverty and inequality but also courage, resourcefulness and active hope, not least the compassion born out of faith of the medical team. Early next morning, the mobile clinic sets out again. In a remote village, the clinic is held in a large hut Women put up a banner promoting a self-help group for patients who've been widowed due to AIDS. Two elderly people wait for the clinic to start. Whilst a woman greets me with the traditional welcome, Wanakam. The clinic is busy and there is little privacy. Nurses sit together at a small metal table and begin weighing people, measuring blood pressures, etc. Some are tested for diabetes. The doctor in the red dress is from North India. She's completing extra training before going back to a hospital in the mountains, originally run by her father. She tells me there is no made road, so it takes many days to reach the hospital. She will be the sole doctor. 
a dedicated woman indeed. A cheerful patient tells a sad story. She has severe burns on her neck, results of a kitchen fire. Perhaps not an accidental injury. It is lunchtime. The clinic staff take a break, finding a cool spot in the field. Clinic tables are erected for our patients. The doctor's given one, and I am given the other. The nurses eat inside the van. I feel awkward, self-conscious. I'd rather be with the nurses in the bubble of chatter. But even so, the experience in the field is novel. Then on to another village. Note the bullocks with painted horns, a reminder of Pongo, Tamil Nadu's New Year celebrations. The cart contains husks of coconuts for fuel. A school wall provides a shady spot for the clinic and people begin to gather. The ground is smooth enough for a man to arrive in a hand-propelled cycle, tricycle. A little boy with Down syndrome curls up on the step. Although the caste system is now illegal, the notice on the school wall records how many of each caste live in the village. School children soon discover there's a foreigner at the clinic. They are full of curiosity and glee and want to touch my skin. They ask, over and over again. What is your name, Auntie? Where do you come from, Auntie? What do you have in your bag, Auntie? In the midst of noise, giggles and distraction, the clinic goes on. Now back to the outskirts of Belor, passing the cafe. fruit sellers. The barber. And amidst hordes of people making their way home from work, we arrive at Karigiri and the day ends with another beautiful sunset and darkness comes quickly. Daya has prepared our food of rice and dal and chapati and the day concludes with her scribbling some words and giving me an impromptu lesson in Tamil. Shanti Gran. It's also run by Karigiri Hospital. It's a peace village for people with leprosy, those too sick or disabled to be rehabilitated. Many people are ill-informed and fear the disease. The people who live here have been rejected by their families. Some are very disfigured and unable to disguise the deformities of face and hands and feet. Even today, leprosy carries a dreadful stigma. This woman is blind. I've known her many years. Her son from whom she was separated has come to live with her. Because he lives in the leprosy community, 
no one will employ him. Her prayer for years has been that he will not be shunned, that he will find work, and that one day some brave and loving girl will marry him. As in any community, life brings tension. Shandigranam being no exception. I'm asked one day to visit the village because a feud has arisen between two residents. I meet with the men involved. The elder, Samikana, looks after a cow and some goats and is responsible for growing vegetables on an arid patch of land. A younger man, Subramani, came to the village but found it hard to adjust to living in this isolated community. However, he bravely set about using his well-developed agricultural skills. Tilling the ground, feeding it with manure, sowing neat rows of vegetables and tending mango trees. His crops grew well until the older man became jealous, denying Subramani access to the precious rationed water and causing the crops to wither. Tension grew, but given the opportunity to talk, anger was diffused and gradually new understanding grew. The afternoon concluded with Subramani extending his hand in a, a gesture of reconciliation and it being shyly received. The beginning of a new relationship and indeed a friendship that continues to this day. Later Subramani who was a Hindu, asked me to baptise him into the community of Christ. A service was arranged and using water from a bucket, four of Shantigranam's residents were baptised with the whole village community turning out in encouraging support. Some years later, with fingerless hands, Subramani was to plant two trees for Jeff and me, very moving. Each year when we visit Shantigranam, we weigh up the trees to see how they've grown. And we look for the first small buds of little yellow flowers. When I turn to the Bible and I read Isaiah 35, I'm always reminded of Carrie Geary. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like crocus. It shall blossom abundantly. Eddie Askew was an author and poet who devoted his life to the relief of leprosy, particularly in India. He was General Secretary of the Leprosy Mission for 13 years and he knew Karagiri well. Perhaps he too had that Isaiah reading in mind when he wrote his poem, Seeing the End from the beginning. The end of the road, a rough track to nowhere, or so it seemed then, over bleak, dust-laden, stony ground, without promise. 
standing on the sun-drenched land, almost a lifetime away. It was hard to see a mind's eye picture of what might be, could be, would be. Brought to life from pencil marks on creased paper. As hard as seeing possibilities for good in broken bodies, hands and lives. But from the stony ground grew hope, fashioned from dreams, sweated into reality through love, stronger than concrete, a sanctuary and a new beginning. A new beginning mirrored by the lives of those who came. Lives broken on the stones of sickness, stunted in the shallow soil of prejudice and fear. But mustard seeds of hope pushed through those rocks, took root, grew, blossomed and bore fruit. The hand of God, through human hands, transforming personalities. The compassion of Christ, reconstructing broken lives through his own broken body. The stony ground, now greened in goodness. God, nowhere then. Now, here.